What's up, Benzettas? Hi! And welcome back to another family reaction video. Today, we're going to be checking out one of our classics, the old military vehicle series. Nice. We've got a special guest. Yep. Kylo, he doesn't want to miss out. He doesn't. He's heard about the fastest bird in the world, oh. and he wants to check it out because he loves chasing birds. He does. So this one is why this plane, why was this plane invulnerable? The SR-71 Blackbird story. Ooh, I like a good story. Yeah. No, apparently, I don't know if it's still the fastest plane in the world, but I think at one point it was the fastest plane. Wow. So let's check it out. Let's do it. Thanks to Squarespace for making this video possible and for helping launch my new mustard store. More on that after this video. In the midst of the Cold War, two MiG-25s race to intercept the threat along the Soviet border. Good point. They're the fastest mm. interceptors ever built. And if they really push their engines, they can reach an incredible Mach 3.2. But it's not enough Whoa. because what they're chasing can outrun and outclimb any threat. A plane engineered to be invulnerable. It'd be scary seeing one of them in the sky. Eh? Yeah. Looks sinister. It does. The Cold War locked the United States and Soviet Union into a tense struggle for global influence and control. Both sides poured enormous resources into military okay. technologies. Whoa. But getting an upper hand means knowing your opponent's next move. And in the 1950s, little was known about facilities deep within the Soviet Union. An extensive network of radar stations, surface-to-air missile sites, and interceptor air bases kept the Americans away. Until 1956, when U-2 spy planes began flying over the Soviet Union. Neither fast nor stealthy, U-2s had one critical advantage. At 70,000 feet, they could fly above Soviet air defenses. That's high. U.S. President Eisenhower was even wow. short. Soviet radars couldn't detect the U-2 at such high altitudes. Mm. But it turns out the Americans were wrong. The Soviets had tracked the U-2 since day one, and it was only a matter of time before they'd be able to shoot one down. Simply flying high wasn't enough. Even before the U-2 began its surveillance missions, there were already plans underway to replace it. Because true impunity over Soviet airspace would need a combination of incredible speed, altitude, and stealth. And this led the Americans to explore some pretty radical spy plane concepts, like a ramjet-powered aircraft that would be deployed from the bottom of a supersonic B-58. Oh, wow. But in 1959, the CIA chose Lockheed to develop the next generation of spy plane. Meanwhile, the U-2 continued to fly over the Soviet Union, but not for very long. Because in the spring of 1960, a Soviet surface-to-air missile finally managed to bring one down. The captured pilot and wreckage were paraded around the Soviet Union, used as proof of Western aggression. As tensions rose, now more than ever, the U.S. needed a replacement for the U-2. Wow. Wow. And what Lockheed developed would be unlike any aircraft ever built. A plane that nearly 60 years after its first flight remains the fastest air-breathing jet to ever fly. Lockheed's highly classified spy Still plane is. would be known as the A-12. Originally used by the CIA for reconnaissance, the A-12 was also developed into an interceptor prototype armed with air-to-air -air missiles, along with a variant that could launch an unmanned reconnaissance drone. But it was the SR-71 Blackbird, a variant developed for the Air Force, that would go on to serve for decades, while earlier versions were quickly retired. The Blackbird could cruise at Mach 3.2, right near the edge of space, and do it for hours on end. To achieve this, Lockheed's engineers had to innovate pretty much everything from scratch. To sustain such incredible speeds, the SR-71 and its predecessors were powered by engines often described as turbo ramjets. Below Mach 2, they functioned like conventional afterburning jet engines. But above that, they behaved more like ramjets, as an inlet cone adjusted to bypass air around the engine and directly into the afterburner. At Mach 3.2, the SR-71's exterior would heat up to beyond 500 degrees Fahrenheit, easily hot enough wow. to soften aircraft aluminum. The Lockheed engineers used titanium for 92% of the aircraft. And in the 1960s, this required inventing entirely new fabrication technologies. 
Its unusual shape did more than just spooky such an unusual looking thing. Eh? It helped reduce its radar signature, as did its special black paint, which earned the SR-71 its Blackbird name. The A-12 and SR-71 were first deployed over North Korea and Vietnam, where they were unsuccessfully targeted by over 800 surface-to-air missiles. <laughs> but the spy plane never flew into Soviet airspace. That was a scary test to go through. Because another shoot-down over the Soviet Union would be catastrophic. Mm. So instead, the SR-71 flew along its borders, using its powerful side-looking radars and cameras to veer hundreds of miles into Soviet territory. And that frustrated the Soviets. In 1976, Viktor Belenko defected to the West by escaping the Soviet Union in his MiG-25. He described the frustration of trying to intercept Blackbirds. The MiGs were Mach 3 capable, but only for a few minutes at a time, not for hours like the Blackbird. Nor could they climb to reach the SR-71's incredible altitude. Even their enormous R-40 missiles lacked the guidance needed to strike the SR-71 head-on. For years, the Blackbirds were practically invulnerable. They could outfly and outclimb any threat. But by the 1980s, MiG-31s were roaming the skies. Equipped with sophisticated radar and long-range R-33 missiles, they posed a legitimate threat, as did a new generation of Soviet surface-to-air missiles. But the greatest threat to the Blackbird wasn't an enemy missile or jet, it was itself. No Blackbird was ever lost on a mission, but more than a third of the 50 built were destroyed in accidents. One Whoa. literally disintegrated around its pilots. They were also enormously expensive to operate, each one siphoning about $300 million a year out of America's defense budget. A wow. fleet of special aerial refuelers and wow. a small army of support and so maintenance expensive. staff were needed just to keep these planes mission ready. And advances in spy satellites, aerial drones, and the SR-71's inability to deliver surveillance data in real time diminished some of the plane's utility. Add to that politics and infighting for defense budgets, and by the late 1980s, the SR-71's days were numbered. They were officially retired in 1998, with two sent to NASA for testing. Wow. The technology behind the A-12 and SR-71 is now well over 50 years old. Yet, somehow these incredible planes still speak to us. Not about the past, but the future. Leaving us with a sense of wonder, unlike any other in aviation history. <laughs> wow, that was really interesting. <laughs> that was. Uh, the part that got me that was a bit scary is the plane disintegrating around the pilots. Yeah, no, that is a little bit scary. I'd like to know a little more about that scenario. My theory is that, like, probably in production or maybe in testing, one, like, even the slightest little, like, nick or, like, weakness in the whole plane, because mm. it goes so fast, that one weakness just turned into the whole thing just, like, falling apart. Probably, yeah. or I don't know, like, some, some sort of catastrophic. A third of them. A third of them. Were destroyed in testing. Yeah, I'd be like, mm. Don't really want to fly that one anymore. Have you got anything else? <laughs> but also, um, my other question was: you know how there's various companies in America that obviously engineers and that that um, put together proposals for new aircraft. Mm, yeah. What if theirs is denied and they've got all this new technology ideas? Yeah. Are they allowed to approach? Like, what do they do with that? Other the ones that, yeah. Like, no, nah, I don't think they would be is able that, to. Or is that just treason? Yeah, I don't know. That's actually a good question. I'm yeah. So what happens to all that work and effort? Yeah. And the other potential technology. But also, can I just say it's crazy how that, that aircraft was developed and made in like the 60s and I 70s. Know. That speaks to the fact that we don't know what's around yeah. right now. That's 60 year old aircraft. I know. And it looks like it's like alien. Yeah. That's insane. So maybe we're in 60 years time, we'll be watching about, well, we're lucky enough to be around. <laughs> what's ha What's been built right now? Yeah, what's like, happening in now? In 2023. Yeah. Oh, that can go around the globe in about 30 seconds. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> so we probably don't know what's out there right now. Yeah, I know. It's crazy, eh? Yeah, it's crazy. Anyway, guys, if you enjoyed that one, make sure you smash the like button and comment as usual. And also, if you want to check out our merch, go to the link down in the description below, www.yournewzealandfamily.com.
Maybe you see something that you like. And every purchase goes towards our trip to America where we yes. can actually see all of the things oh, in person. And we can't wait. We can't wait. Yeah, and also make sure you subscribe if you haven't already and hit the post notification bell. Do all the usual stuff, all the good fun stuff. Check us out on Instagram. And we love you guys, and we'll see you in the next one. Bye! Bye.